An accident, two couples. Have an affair before getting married, who knows, you might find true love. Eleanor's acquaintance with Wyatt was truly accidental. She considered herself not a chaste and virtuous lady, yet not one to be indiscriminate in her choices. While studying in England, being far from her homeland unleashed her natural instincts completely. The student circle was filled with exaggerated and sensuous encounters, but she had never indulged. Interestingly, this trait aligned with her fiancé. Both of them, despite their rich dating experiences, maintained a conventional approach in their relationship, avoiding the allure of bars and nightclubs as moral models, as teased by friends. Eleanor didn't take offense at such remarks. Truth be told, despite the apparent harmony and respect in her relationship, both she and her fiancé were too fond of playing roles, revealing little of their true selves to each other. Over time, it became dull. Their seemingly tranquil and loving life was eventually shattered by a traffic accident. One evening, amidst the bustling streets of the city, Eleanor drove slowly, intending to visit a newly opened French restaurant nearby. She focused intently on the steering wheel, afraid of any potential collisions, not so much for the compensation but out of genuine concern for her car. However, fate had other plans. Just as she successfully avoided an elderly woman walking unsteadily, she failed to notice a child suddenly darting out from a corner. Unable to evade in time, a young man in white t-shirt and shorts, with short cropped hair, swept in like a whirlwind. In the blink of an eye, he pushed the child out of harm's way, leaving the little one in tears, scolded by the parents and taken home. In comparison, Wyatt fared much worse. He felt his knees hit the ground heavily, and his immediate instinct was to retrieve his phone from his pocket. Unfortunately, the screen was completely shattered, a gift from his girlfriend just two days ago on his birthday. Wyatt tried to struggle to his feet but found his legs in considerable pain. Eleanor bent down, anxiously asking, I'm sorry, how are you feeling right now? Probably a bit fractured, Wyatt assessed based on experience. Oh, that's serious, Eleanor turned away quickly, leaving Wyatt to think she might be attempting a hit and run. He looked up helplessly. Unexpectedly, she returned with a thin blanket from her car, offering it as a cushion. She reassured him, don't worry, I've just called for an ambulance, it'll be here soon. Eleanor squatted by the roadside, gentle in her movements, and her tone soothing. The evening breeze lifted the hem of her knee-length skirt, revealing ivory-like skin on her calves glistening in the sunset. Wyatt dared not look, turning his head to the side, his heart pounding. Yet, in this moment, all Eleanor cared about were the slightly dented front of her car and the yet-to-be-tasted French cuisine. Hearing about Eleanor's car accident, Hudson was genuinely worried for her. They were preparing for their wedding early next year, and with the date already set, any mishap, especially involving legal issues or accidents, could affect their plans. Fortunately, everything turned out fine, just a false alarm. Now he could continue being the steady fiancé without facing stern lectures from his father or reprimands. Eleanor stood by the hospital room door, lost in thought, hugging her arms. Hudson walked over, gently embracing her, and kissing the top of her head. Sorry I'm late. You weren't too scared, were you? Leaning against his chest, Eleanor replied, I have a bit of psychological trauma. I don't feel like driving for a while. In Hudson's mind, he wholeheartedly agreed. With her driving skills, it might be wise to keep it to a minimum. However, he couldn't say that directly. He smiled tenderly and said, no problem. If you don't want to drive, I'll be the chauffeur from now on. On the other side, Wyatt had a fractured left leg, lying in bed with a cast, looking somewhat comical, like a puppet with strings. His girlfriend, Ariel, sat nearby. Upon seeing someone enter, she put the partially eaten apple back on the fruit tray, wiped her hands, and awkwardly stood up. The four exchanged polite greetings. For some reason, Hudson felt an instant aversion to the girl. With her two braids, plain green dress, and round cheeks, she looked immature and wore a somewhat tacky, rural outfit. The thick countryside vibe made him want to laugh. What's even more ridiculous is that she took their polite words seriously. The doctor instructed that Wyatt needed bed rest. Eleanor took on all his medical expenses, hoping to settle the matter quickly with money and move on. As the two were leaving, Hudson added, If you face any difficulties, feel free to call. Here's my business card. Unexpectedly, Ariel chased them out of the room. Wait, Miss Eleanor, Mr. Hudson, her face was pale under the corridor lights, but her eyes were bright and determined. I just graduated from college and am still looking for a job. Do you have any suitable positions? Could you recommend me? Hudson suddenly felt like he had fallen into her trap. 
The girl, appearing awkward and clumsy, was surprisingly thick-skinned. Eleanor was caught off guard, asking, Ariel, what's your major? English. Which school? Foreign languages. Oh, that's quite good, a professional background. Eleanor turned to Hudson, exchanging glances with him. She spoke insincerely. Poking Hudson's arm, she said, Hudson, I remember you attended foreign language attached high school, right? Ariel seems quite faded with you, almost like your junior. Can you help her out? She winked at him. You really know how to talk. A junior from a different realm. Hudson thought. Still, he gracefully nodded, yeah, what a coincidence. Our company deals with translations. How about it, Ariel? Are you interested in joining? I can give it a try, she replied confidently. Hudson insincerely responded, sure. Send me your resume, and I'll have HR send you an interview invitation. Really? Thank you so much. I'll prepare seriously. The girl bowed 90 degrees, watching the couple leave the hospital lobby. The first time Ariel saw those two, she thought they were exceptionally beautiful. Not the kind of beauty crafted with cosmetics but an innate aura nurtured by wealth and status. However, she didn't feel inferior. After graduation, she faced numerous rejections in her job search. It was normal, she reminded herself. The more challenging life became, the more one needed to stay calm, face challenges boldly, and seize every fleeting opportunity. Wyatt didn't entirely agree with her approach, he found it a bit embarrassing. He muttered, Ariel, they are indeed wealthy, but they've compensated for what was necessary. They don't owe us anything. Offering yourself like this, what if it doesn't work out? Isn't that humiliating? After finishing the remaining apple, Ariel, with a cheerful smile, handed it to his lips. Wyatt, I haven't stolen, robbed, or deceived anyone. I don't see what's shameful about this. If I fail, I'll start again from scratch. Her simple philosophy often left him speechless. Wyatt sighed, what you're saying is true, but it feels like we're moralizing them, and that's not good. Ariel waved her hand, oh, don't worry about that. I can't moralize them. The wealthier they are, the less morality they have. Otherwise, how did they get their money? Wyatt burst into laughter and couldn't help but pinch her cheek. What twisted logic. Ariel insisted, it's the truth. They playfully bantered for a while until Wyatt's father called. The phone still worked, and Wyatt casually shared a few greetings, withholding the news of the accident. After hanging up, he stared absentmindedly at his girlfriend. Ariel nudged him, what are you thinking? I'm thinking I'll spend this New Year's Eve at your place this year, Wyatt held her hand. My dad just asked me when we plan to get married. Ariel casually replied, I'm fine with that. Every New Year, it's just my mom and me. If you come back, she'll be thrilled. However, Wyatt wore a troubled expression. But we don't have money. What can we use to get married? If I had known Eleanor was so generous, I should have pretended to be more injured, let her pay more compensation. Ariel pointed at him, raising her voice, Hey, you talk about moralizing, but aren't you the real hit-and-run master? Wyatt touched her face, sorry for making you suffer with me. Ariel laughed, Wyatt, I'm more concerned about your leg than saving money for the wedding. You need to recover quickly and stop doing silly things. Okay, I'll listen to you. That night, Ariel didn't return to her rented room. She curled up in the corner of the hospital bed, watching Wyatt's face as he slept deeply. At that moment, she was too young and naive to realize that it would be the last time they embraced each other without distractions. It was a Monday, and Hudson had been restless since early morning. The source of his discomfort was none other than Ariel. Last week, she had come for an interview at the company, still dressing in a less-than-impressive manner. She foolishly smiled at him, revealing an untimely set of crooked teeth. Eleanor would never do such a thing. Hudson couldn't understand why he found himself comparing Ariel to his fiancée. How could she even be considered a match? All he remembered was that he strongly disliked Ariel. The interview arrangement was initially just a formality, but the director of operations, Jimena, told him, Boss, I want this girl. He found himself in a dilemma and had to compromise. Hudson stood in front of the dressing mirror, angrily changing several ties. Strangely, none seemed to satisfy him. Eleanor observed it all. When Hudson's expression softened a bit, she walked up to him, kissed his cheek, and calmly helped him tie the tie. What's wrong, Hudson? Something on your mind? Company matters, nothing major, Hudson exchanged a peck with her, a smile playing on his lips. Did you sleep well last night? Eleanor wanted to say no, not at all. This guy kept tossing and turning from four or five in the morning, and she wished she could just kick him off the bed. 
But there was no choice. They both loved putting up a front, so she managed with, not bad, dear. Have a smooth drive. Hudson received the soothing love from his gentle and dignified fiancé, which should have calmed his mood. That's what he reminded himself. However, as he stepped into the elevator, Ariel grinned at him with a carefree wave. Hey, Hudson, good morning. She was wearing that green dress again, all smiles, completely out of place. Hudson couldn't be bothered to deal with her, glancing down at his tie. He almost exclaimed in shock, it was also a green checkered one. He felt so frustrated that he wanted to smash into a wall. After enduring Hudson's cold attitude three times, Ariel decided not to pamper him anymore. She resolved to ignore his moods and be cruel to the end. It was just a job, she earned money with her intellect, not by begging. If she needed to flatter anyone, it would be Jimena, her immediate superior. At lunch in the restaurant, Jimena even discreetly asked her if she was Hudson's distant relative. Ariel just smiled, neither confirming nor denying. She speculated silently that Hudson's real reason for disliking her might be to avoid suspicion. By not having any connection with her, he could prevent her from attaching herself and using him. Well, she could understand that. Suddenly, she felt a surge of kindness towards him. Every time she bumped into Hudson while making coffee in the pantry, Ariel took the initiative to avoid him, staying far away. Yet, he seemed unsatisfied, always finding fault with her through Jimena. The printer not working? Blame Ariel. The janitor made the floor too slippery? Blame Ariel. Lunchbox in the microwave? Also blame Ariel. Many colleagues ordered various takeouts, why didn't he complain about their strong smells? Ariel was confused. After work, returning to her rented room, Wyatt was cooking in the kitchen. His leg cast had been removed, and he was preparing to return to work in a few days. Did you get a hard time today? He asked, obviously referring to Hudson. No, Ariel shook her head, sounding triumphant, I'm much smarter now. I automatically disappear when he's around. In fact, Hudson might not be that bad. After all, he genuinely helped you. Don't make things too awkward with him. Humph, I've dealt with him enough to know it's all a facade. In reality, he's arrogant, looks down on everyone, like an irritable swan, ready to bite at people. Ariel chuckled at her own analogy, he would love to force me to leave. I won't leave, I'll tease him a bit. The aroma of food wafted through the room. Wyatt took off his apron and called her over to eat. At the dinner table, Ariel glanced at his new phone, expressing surprise, wow, this is the latest model. Wyatt, how could you afford such an expensive one? I didn't buy it, Wyatt thought for a moment, his gaze somewhat evasive, it was a reward for valor, given by the company. After saying this, he discreetly observed her expression. Wow, that's great, she replied obliviously, savoring her food with delight, her cheeks filled like a certain rodent. Wyatt felt a mix of relief and guilt. He couldn't explain why he had lied. When Wyatt received a call from Eleanor, he felt a bit bewildered. Her voice was pleasant, gentle, like the spring water, pronouncing his name with lingering tenderness. She mentioned that the model for her art studio was unexpectedly absent and felt that his physique would be suitable. She asked if he was interested. I can give it a try, he replied, somewhat curious about Eleanor, and surprisingly agreed. That's wonderful, Eleanor laughed, her voice melodious. Wyatt, you're truly my savior. Her praise left Wyatt feeling dizzy. He envisioned Eleanor's frosty face becoming lively and joyful because of him, bringing him immense satisfaction. Eleanor's art studio was even more luxurious and stylish than he had imagined. Situated in the high-value waterfront building, the spacious studio was meticulously decorated, exuding an elegant atmosphere. Various art supplies were abundant, giving the place a considerable value. Wyatt felt an indescribable shock. He and Eleanor came from completely different worlds, and if not for the unexpected car accident, they would never have crossed paths. Yet, here she was, sitting in front of him, looking as beautiful as a figure in a painting. He couldn't help but gaze at her profile. Wyatt, Wyatt. Ah, Eleanor's sudden call snapped him out of his thoughts. He blushed, feeling embarrassed and at a loss. Sorry, I, I seem to have spaced out a bit. It's okay. I've already finished the painting, you did great, she reassured him, showing him the completed work. Look, your gaze is very affectionate, exactly the feeling I wanted. Have you modeled before? No, Wyatt's face was a bit warm, and he waved his hand. In high school and college, I only practiced track and field for a while. After getting injured, I didn't continue. Oh, an athlete? No wonder you have such excellent conditions. 
It seems like my choice was right, Eleanor smiled. Before leaving the studio, Wyatt received a new phone. Eleanor mentioned that she should have compensated him during their last encounter but was in a hurry. Wyatt thanked her sincerely. She patted his shoulder. Hey, Wyatt, will you come again in the future? Her eyes filled with anticipation. He turned back and solemnly promised, I'll come, I'll definitely come. It felt like they had entered into some kind of secretive agreement. Ever since Ariel joined the company, Hudson feels that there is not a single peaceful day for him. That girl seems to have ADHD, constantly bouncing around in his mind, making him unusually annoyed. In the first week of her joining, she still had some conscience, actively greeting him and showing some kindness. However, in the second week, her true colors were revealed. When she saw him, she pretended not to notice him and just walked straight past him. What does she think she is? Daring to ignore him like this. Hudson is angry about it, but he can't express it directly, so he can only resort to indirect methods. Ariel often needs to use the printer, so he waits there, hoping to catch her in the act. Sure enough, she hesitated and said, Hudson, you go do something else, let me handle this. He thought Ariel had finally come to her senses, showing concern for his hard work. However, he quickly realized that she was only worried that he might break the printer. How shameful. Deciding to take the initiative, he scolded her harshly, Why are you still lingering here? Go find someone to repair it or figure it out yourself. Do you want everyone to line up and wait for you? Fine, I'll go now, she hurried away. After saying that, Hudson regretted it a bit. During lunch break, he had the secretary order coffee and milk tea for all the employees. Unexpectedly, Ariel showed no gratitude, leaving her portion for someone else and saying, I don't like to drink. Hudson was convinced that she was intentionally trying to embarrass him. If she doesn't drink it, what's the point of him buying it? Her self-brought lunch is also some kind of garbage, with unappetizing-looking dishes. Surprisingly, she still eats it all. When Jimena asked her, did you cook these yourself? She insincerely replied, no, no, my boyfriend made them. He's been resting at home recently. Turns out, her taste is so poor that she can only appreciate such mediocre food. Hudson hates it when she smiles every time Wyatt is mentioned. Why can't she smile at him? Ariel smiles at everyone, even at Colin. Colin is the most notorious playboy in their company. As an interpreter who frequently travels for business, he has relationships with girls all over the world. Ariel even pretends to slip and fall, then takes advantage of the situation to have intimate contact with Colin, openly flirting. Truly morally corrupt, sweeping away all decency. Due to unexplained anger, Hudson's pen suffered the consequences. Hudson, in a fit of rage, stabbed it into his desk. Ariel's face seemed to float on the desktop, and she pleaded softly, ouch, please be gentle. Hudson felt like he was being driven insane. He forcefully pulled out the pen but, not holding it steady, the sharp tip cut a gash in his left hand, drawing a bit of blood. Cursing silently, he got up to clean up at the sink. The sound of running water echoed loudly. Hudson heard footsteps behind him, turned around, still with residual anger in his eyes. Ariel, upon seeing him, restrained her smile and explained in a stiff manner, Jimena asked me to bring the first aid kit. I didn't know it was you. Sorry. She put down the items and was about to leave. Hold on, Hudson, still upset, called out to her, can't you see I'm bleeding? She lifted her head, looking confused. So, should I disinfect it for you? Hmm, Hudson snorted disdainfully. He extended his arm, watching as Ariel applied iodine to his wound. Her hair was dark and dense, usually tied into two braids, but not that day. Where are your braids? He almost reached out to touch. Huh? She looked puzzled. Didn't you say it damages the company's image? When did I say that? He was stubborn. Just a couple of days ago, she tilted her face up, a disdainful tone in her voice. Forgetful benefactor. Find some time to eat more walnuts, nourish your brain, so you won't age too fast. What's with your attitude? Dare to speak to me like this. Hudson laughed out of frustration, and the atmosphere eased a bit. He wanted to continue the conversation, but unfortunately, Eleanor called, reminding him to have dinner at his parents' house tonight. Thinking about his father, Hudson felt dispirited. Meanwhile, Colin enthusiastically organized a gathering and invited him, suggesting the old place. He declined with a weary expression. Acting as if finishing a meal, showing filial piety. Hudson drove Eleanor home, not saying much along the way, his thoughts elsewhere. Feeling the atmosphere was a bit too cold, he tried to initiate a conversation. Eleanor, dealing with my dad must be a headache, right? 
It's okay, Eleanor smiled. My parents are even more difficult to handle. You'll have to work hard when the time comes. Looking at it this way, they were truly birds of a feather. Yeah, let's support each other, Hudson surprisingly spoke sincerely. Eleanor looked straight ahead, her tone natural. Yes, after all, we are made for each other. Don't you think so, Hudson? That's right. Hudson seized the opportunity to convince himself. Since they enjoyed the protection of their families, they had to endure equivalent restraints. Only he and Eleanor could truly understand each other. Back home, the two sat on the sofa watching a movie. Eleanor leaned on his shoulder, and they kissed from time to time. Hudson felt it was good and wonderful, finally not thinking about all the messy people and things. Life should be spent smoothly like this. However, when Eleanor unintentionally asked about the wound on his arm, Hudson was momentarily stunned, suddenly remembering Ariel. Her face, her braids, her mockery, her anger, her intimacy with Colin, her avoidance of him, all of it twisted his heart. Damn it. All his psychological constructions were in vain. After the dispersed gathering, Ariel stood at the door bidding farewell to her colleagues. To save on rent, she lived far from the company and was in a hurry to catch the subway. Colin, although not heading in the same direction, persisted in accompanying her, insisting on inviting her to the bar for a couple more drinks. During dinner, he had stuck to her closely, pouring her drinks. His intentions were quite clear. Ariel didn't directly refuse. She made an excuse to go to the supermarket, wandered around inside, and bought some household items. When she came out, the night was dark, and she couldn't help but sneeze, holding her arms and quickening her pace. A car on the roadside was honking wildly, aggressive and noisy. As Ariel passed by, the car window rolled down, revealing Hudson's angry face. He said angrily, get in the car. I don't want to, Ariel cautiously held onto her bag. Get in, I'll say it one last time. Seeing her unmoved, Hudson got off the car with an angry face, circled to the passenger side, opened the door, and almost pulled her into the car, threatening, sit down, dare to move, and see what happens. Ariel felt puzzled, Hudson, why are you so angry with me? This strange goose really left her baffled. Hudson gritted his teeth, who let you be so cheap? He had purposely returned home, only to see her getting close to Colin. She took the drink from Colin, finished it in one go, and laughed more brightly than flowers. If you like drinking so much, why not drink into Colin's bed? Ariel, what are you pretending to be reserved for with me? Ariel stared at him, lips trembling with anger. I drink for myself. Even if I sleep with him, what's it to you? Why do you scold me like this? Why? Hudson sneered, because your job is given by me. You owe me, and you're seducing my employees. If I don't scold you, then who? Asshole, stop wrongly accusing me. Ariel's voice suddenly rose, she was truly angered. Do you think you can deceive me about what kind of person Colin is? No, you knew he was interested in me a long time ago, but you just stood by and watched. Although you're the boss, you dare not do anything to him. You only dare to insult me because I'm poor, humble, not worth mentioning, and because I'm a girl. And all of you are on the same side. As Ariel spoke, tears surged uncontrollably. She wiped them away randomly, but the more she wiped, the more they flowed. Frantically, she tried to open the car door, but her hands were too slippery. Hudson grabbed her shoulder, shouting angrily, let go of me, I want to go home. Hudson endured, I'll take you home. No, no, stay away from me. She desperately wanted to escape, which infuriated Hudson even more. He didn't argue with her, he had already compromised to her, did she still expect him to apologize? With the vast difference in strength between men and women, Hudson easily restrained her. Their heads were pressed together so closely that he could see the tiny hairs on her skin surface, the wet eyelashes soaked in tears, and the mouth that always made him uncomfortable. Almost instinctively, he kissed her. Ariel turned her head to avoid, and their faces moved apart. His lips pressed against her neck, rubbing against it awkwardly. Unable to move, she began to scream. He paid no attention, turned her chin, and forced her to kiss him. Or maybe it wasn't a kiss but closer to a bite. The taste of blood filled their mouths. It was the second time Hudson got injured that day. Finally, he let go of Ariel. She endured the pain and slapped him hard, Hudson, you're insane. He didn't dodge, taking the hit head on. In his mind, meeting her was like dealing with a lunatic. He had never kissed someone so desperately, like a beast on the verge of losing control. He felt dangerous but also excited. Adjusting his breathing, Hudson sat back in the driver's seat and started the car. Ariel hurriedly stopped him, what are you doing? 
What else can I do? Hudson said without goodwill, I'll take you home. If you don't want to die, don't try to grab the steering wheel. This time, Ariel really quieted down, silently fastening her seatbelt. The car sped through the city's neon lights, and they resisted each other, not exchanging a single word. On this Saturday, Eleanor woke up feeling refreshed. The housekeeper brought her breakfast. After some thought, she smiled and said, please make a sobering soup for my husband. Of course, madam. The housekeeper agreed and went into the kitchen. Yesterday, Hudson came back very late, and even after taking a shower, the smell of alcohol still lingered on him. He wouldn't be feeling great this morning. Eleanor, I'm really considerate of you, she thought proudly. However, later, she would also show consideration to another person. He was much younger than Hudson, more obedient, with eyes burning and transparent, making it unnecessary for her to guess, as the passion was evident. At the age of 30, hormones needed to be stimulated, otherwise, life would be quite dull. Unable to recall how many times he had come as a model, the class was cancelled, and the students were not around. Wyatt arrived very early and was coaxed by Eleanor to visit an art exhibition. He seemed a bit slow, only realizing at the entrance, I've probably been deceived by you. How so? She asked with interest. There wasn't supposed to be class today, but you didn't inform me. He seemed a bit wronged. Um, so you're blaming me? Eleanor deliberately misinterpreted his words. You didn't want to accompany me, you found me annoying. It's not like that, I'm willing. Wyatt scratched the back of his head, a bit incoherent. What I mean is, I don't understand art at all, and I've never been to a place like this. I'm worried that I'll disappoint you. But you are art itself. Eleanor stared into his eyes, emotionally saying, you are my most proud creation. Isn't that enough? While he was slightly stunned, she lowered her head, quietly approaching his hand, and gently slid her fingers through his. Wyatt, I just want you to be with me. Wyatt's face turned as red as if it was about to bleed. He dared not look at her, hesitated for a moment, and little by little, he gripped her hand back, tightly intertwining their fingers. His knuckles were distinct, with a slight callus on the palm, a touch coarser compared to Hudson's hand. Eleanor liked it very much. Throughout the exhibition, they held hands intimately, like a couple in passionate love. After leaving the exhibition hall, they realized it was pouring rain outside. They were drenched, and after some difficulty, they managed to hail a taxi. Crouched together in the small back seat of the car, their skin touched, intensifying the poignant feelings of separation. Eleanor shook Wyatt's arm reluctantly, I don't want to go home yet, I don't want to be apart from you. I don't want that either. Wyatt's gaze stayed closely on her, his throat feeling dry, but your clothes are soaked. If you don't change them in time, you might catch a cold. It's okay, we can catch a cold together. Eleanor whispered in his ear, her voice sounding like a spell cast by a siren. Wyatt felt as if he had fallen into the deep sea. His brain was flooded, gurgling to a stop. In this city's unnoticed hidden corners, stripping away all moral restraints, they acted solely on instinct. Wyatt, the day we first met, I already thought of this scene. She caressed his face and said. That night of torrential rain, the hotel room door closed. Stripped wet clothes, crumpled white sheets, buzzing unanswered calls, and the lies they would tell their respective partners afterward seemed to herald the complete change in their relationship. Looking ahead, whether it was heaven or an abyss, it was hard to distinguish. The present happiness was too captivating to break free from. Wyatt couldn't wait to see Eleanor. Every time they met, there was a week-long interval. He was dissatisfied with this frequency, and the longing for her constantly surrounded him, making it hard to focus on work. Finally reaching the weekend, Wyatt got up early. His mood was exceptionally good, feeling the sunshine was brilliant, wanting to smile at everyone, except Ariel. As he prepared to leave, she was still sprawled in bed, sound asleep, with the blanket kicked onto the floor. Lately, Wyatt increasingly found her childish, rude, and unreasonable. He had almost forgotten how he decided to date her in the first place. Oh, he remembered now, it was because they were fellow townspeople, both attending local universities, naturally coming together while drifting in different places. As for love, he felt it was almost non-existent. When he was with Eleanor, everything was vibrant and dynamic. They could thoroughly enjoy exploring each other's pleasures. However, it wasn't the same with Ariel. Her brain seemed like an undeveloped, completely ignorant, desolate land. She had never uttered any words of love, never acted coquettish, and never argued with him. It was like dealing with a machine programmed with no emotions. Maybe she simply didn't understand love. 
On Friday night, Ariel had a company dinner, and she called Wyatt several times, hoping he could come to pick her up. Wyatt felt it was unnecessary, especially since he didn't own a car. What more could he do than make him run a few extra errands? Given the time, he preferred to chat with Eleanor. In the end, he didn't go. When she returned, her face looked terrible. When he asked what happened, she just said expressionlessly, got bitten by a goose. Then she went to the bathroom to take a shower, spending almost half an hour inside, and came out, went straight to bed, covering her head, and fell into a deep sleep. The pillow was wet the next day. Wyatt thought she was selfish, capricious, unreasonable, and still a girl who hadn't grown up. He couldn't imagine that three months ago, he had tried to marry her. Now, it seemed like a terrifying idea. However, he still put aside the past grievances, tucked her in, and earnestly prepared breakfast and lunch for her. Wyatt felt he had been extremely kind to Ariel. She should be grateful. With a joyful heart, he went to meet Eleanor. As he modeled for her and became her muse of inspiration, after the class ended, students and assistants gradually left, and they hid in the lounge, passionately entwining and kissing. From the table to the carpet, their bodies tightly intertwined, like dying fish struggling and fighting on the shore, oxygen only existing in each other's mouths. Eleanor was exceptionally fierce, and Wyatt often felt like he was about to be devoured by her. His mind was in a steamy haze, and he couldn't help but bite her. However, Eleanor suddenly whimpered, breaking free from his embrace. Wyatt sat up, his forehead sweaty, his expression hazy. What's wrong? Eleanor licked her lips and smiled, saying, my tongue hurts a bit. I'm sorry, Eleanor. Wyatt muttered and couldn't help but climb over to kiss her. His face was flushed, his ears burning, and his fluffy, soft hair made him feel like a little puppy, overly eager to attract her attention. Eleanor felt thoroughly delighted, but that day she had an important dinner appointment and couldn't afford to be preoccupied. She pushed him away again. After hearing him somewhat disappointed, he pleaded, looking at her, when can we meet again? I miss you so much. Tomorrow. Eleanor embraced his neck, comforting him, we'll go on a date tomorrow. Plus, I have good news to tell you. Well, then I'll wait for you. Wyatt reluctantly hugged her, his fingertips brushing against her lips, exchanging a lingering, moist, long kiss. Ariel spent the entire night having nightmares. She knew very well that the instigator of these dreams was none other than Hudson. She didn't know what he was thinking or why he would do such things to her. All she knew was that it was a brutal and unreasonable release, evidence of his contempt for her dignity. Violence was violence, and its essence wouldn't change despite its romanticized appearance. Hudson's brutal kiss was, in essence, no different from the slap he gave her. Last night, they had simply had a fierce fight, and Ariel preferred to define it that way. Feeling isolated and helpless, Ariel wanted to talk to Wyatt about the company matters and Hudson's true nature. However, he reacted extremely coldly, leaving her with nothing to say. The next day, Wyatt went to work overtime again, and Ariel heard nothing from him on the weekends. Since he got a new phone, he seemed completely different. Ariel couldn't quite pinpoint what had changed, but it felt like everything had. Ariel spent the whole day at home, determined to clear her mind. In the evening, when she came out of the bathroom, Wyatt was wearing only shorts. The sliding door to the balcony was open, and Ariel stood by the window enjoying the cool breeze. Despite his calls, she didn't respond. Suddenly, Wyatt felt a bit annoyed. He took three quick steps and reached her, grabbing her face with his hand. Unexpectedly, he saw her swollen eyes, and his demeanor gradually softened. Why are you crying like this? He wiped her eye corner and asked, have you had dinner? Yeah, I ate. Ariel leaned on the railing, looking away, and said, I'm fine. You go to sleep first. Not getting the response he expected, Wyatt felt unusually frustrated. But on second thought, what did he expect Ariel to say? Did he want her to question him, blame him, confront him without hesitation, or desperately try to keep him? He couldn't figure out what she had discovered, and it perplexed him. A fierce flame burned inside him, yet his mind was a tangled mess. Without a word, he grabbed Ariel's hand, dragging her straight to the bedroom. He spoke harshly, you're fine, right? Perfect, because I have something to do. He roughly pushed her down, removed her pajamas in a hurried and erratic manner, as if expressing some resentment or venting some dissatisfaction. The bed creaked. Wyatt closed his eyes, seemingly immersed in it. Ariel watched the whole process with a cold gaze. She never found much pleasure in it and had no idea what Wyatt was thinking at this moment. It felt elusive, bizarre, absurd, like they didn't understand each other, harbored some resentment, 
yet engaged in the most intimate act in the world. She simply didn't understand men. As the new week began, from the moment Hudson stepped into the office building, he nervously searched for Ariel's figure. To be honest, he felt wary of her. Having kissed her, he feared she might misunderstand, thinking he had some ulterior motive. That night, he had acted impulsively. Men often make mistakes when dealing with women, sooner or later. He believed it was irrelevant. His immediate concern was to be vigilant against Ariel. If she were to take advantage of the situation and entangle herself with him, how would he handle it? Until someone reminded him, boss, boss, why don't you come in? He snapped back to reality. The elevator doors in front of him were open, and Ariel was chatting amiably with Jimena. Their eyes met, she smiled and even nodded at him, something she had never done before. Hudson felt like fleeing on the spot. That bloody and painful kiss still lingered on his lips. Ariel enticed him to overstep boundaries, yet she remained indifferent. Could she truly believe he was expressing affection towards her and could manipulate him with that? He couldn't let her succeed, he thought. For the next period, Hudson deliberately ignored Ariel's influence on him. He started being extra gentle with Eleanor, attempting to prove that he could fully control his emotions and desires. One night, Hudson personally cooked dinner for his fiancée. Candlelight flickered, fine wine wafted, creating a perfect and romantic atmosphere that pleasantly surprised Eleanor. She ran over and hugged him from behind, saying, What's up with you lately? So passionate. Hudson was satisfied with her reaction, holding her hand and saying, As long as you like it. How's the food? Well, it's okay. Eleanor ate with grace, commenting reasonably, but you're better at Western cuisine. In contrast, Hudson thought of another person. Watching Ariel chew with her cheeks bulging like a squirrel, lacking any grace, made him contrast their differences. Remember when we first arrived in the UK, you couldn't even make scrambled eggs. Now you can cook such complex dishes, Eleanor reminisced about their study abroad experience, realizing he was absent-minded. She interrupted his thoughts, asking, Hudson, what are you laughing at? Hmm? Hudson felt a bit embarrassed, quickly taking a sip of wine to cover up. It seems my cooking skills have improved a lot, thanks to your supervision. Eleanor looked at him across the table, smiling but silent. That night, Hudson seemed unusually excited. They embraced each other tightly, caressing, kissing. When the passion reached its peak, lips next to ears expressed love and gratitude. Everything seemed to fall into place, proceeding step by step. They were the most perfect, most compatible lovers. Yet, as the passion cooled, and Eleanor went to the bathroom, Hudson sat on the bed, suddenly aware and terrified. When he hugged Eleanor from behind just now, the face in his mind was Ariel's, he despised her character but longed for her kisses. He felt like he was losing his mind. Picking up his phone, his fingers unconsciously swiped, finding Ariel's number, hesitating to dial. In the waiting intervals, he wondered what he would say to her. Criticize her for not doing her job well or be straightforward and say, I miss you. Both seemed abnormal. Hudson stared at the screen, nervously breathless. Beep beep beep. The phone emitted a brief busy tone. He raised his eyebrows in disbelief, wide-eyed. Yet, stubbornly, he redialed a few times in the next ten minutes, all of which were unceremoniously rejected. She must be doing this on purpose. He was genuinely about to go mad. Eleanor came out of the shower and saw Hudson's frustrated yet concealed expression. Without saying anything, she quietly slipped into the study, locked the door, and called Wyatt. He answered quickly, sounding pleased, is that you? Then who were you waiting for? Eleanor playfully retorted. Oh, it's that girl who asked for your contact information a few days ago. She's quite attractive, right? Wyatt quickly denied, I didn't give it to them. Eleanor generously said, it's okay if you did. Wyatt remained silent for a while, sounding somewhat aggrieved, but I consider you my girlfriend. You're the only one in my heart. Eleanor reassured him, I was just joking. But I was serious. He spoke earnestly. Eleanor, I love you. Don't joke like that with me. Okay, okay, I know. Eleanor casually acknowledged. His confession didn't move her, instead, she found it amusing. Those three words, she usually used them for flirting. Wyatt was unaware of her thoughts. He recently changed jobs. Eleanor thought he had a good appearance and tried to recommend him to friends in the entertainment industry. Unexpectedly, he ended up becoming a signed artist through various twists and turns. In the bedroom, Ariel still wore headphones, watching foreign films with intense focus, reciting words, and diligently practicing listening every day. When Wyatt entered, he glanced around. 
No subtitles, mostly dialogues, quite dull. He couldn't understand how she managed to watch it. They no longer had a common language. Wyatt was convinced that Ariel had never paid attention to his work. He worked through the night on shoots, often stayed out, or got some minor injuries, and she remained indifferent. If they did meet, she would greet him as if they were ordinary roommates. Wyatt looked at her slender back and thought, at this point, they could never go back. The mattress slightly sunk. Ariel turned off the lights, lying down quietly. Wyatt, lying on his back, calmly said, Ariel, let's talk. Okay. She seemed to have anticipated it. I haven't told you, I signed with a talent agency. I've acted in a few dramas, so now I can be considered an actor. Wow, I heard that actors make a lot of money. Wyatt, you've secretly become rich without telling me, huh, she said, casual as ever. It's a bit better than before, he admitted. That's good, she said with a smile. Now, if you get married, you won't have to worry about money anymore. No need to stage car accidents for compensation, haha. <laughs> She started choking up while laughing. In the darkness, Wyatt couldn't see her face, only hearing slight inhales. His heart felt a sharp pain like needles. Eight months ago, he had no money, just a simple wish to marry her. Now, with a bit of a future, the person he planned to marry was no longer her. Turning to face Ariel, Wyatt prepared to touch her face, but she stopped him. She covered her eyes with the back of her hand and said, I'm fine, don't pity me. I'm sorry, Wyatt withdrew his hand, muttering, I'm sorry. It seems I can't continue to love you like before. Maybe we never really loved each other. It was just a lonely time that coincided with the need for companionship. Ariel didn't refute him, just softly asked, when are you moving out? Before the weekend, Wyatt felt relieved. He had already made plans. I've paid the next quarter's rent for you. This Chinese New Year, I won't go to your home. Let your mom know. Okay, I will, she said, holding back tears. After that, in an unspoken understanding, her breathing became more regular, seemingly falling asleep. Wyatt didn't close his eyes all night. At five in the morning, he energetically left, ready to embrace a new life. Hudson arrived at the office only to discover that Ariel had taken three consecutive days off, citing family matters on the leave form without specifying further. Hudson recalled the night when she repeatedly hung up his calls and wondered if she was avoiding him. Three days passed swiftly, and Ariel still hadn't returned, extending her leave for an additional two days. Jimena kindly explained, Ariel called, her mother had surgery, and she needs to stay at the hospital to take care of her. We'll share her workload for now. Surprisingly, Hudson began to feel anxious. Would she come back? On the second day after revealing everything to Wyatt, Ariel's mother suddenly experienced complications with kidney stones and was rushed to the hospital by an ambulance. Upon receiving the call, Ariel immediately bought a ticket and rushed back home. Her mother was worried that she might delay her work and advised her to go back early. Ariel comforted her with a smile, it's okay, there are always other jobs, but there's only one mom. Ariel genuinely didn't expect Hudson to persistently track her down at home. When she saw him in the hospital lobby, she hesitated to acknowledge him. Hold on, that familiar voice called out. Ariel cautiously approached until she saw his face full of resentment. Suddenly, she couldn't help but burst into laughter, your hair looks like a chicken nest, haha. <laughs> Laugh all you want. Hudson stared at her with a cold face. I drove for over eight hours without even eating. Explain to me, why did you keep hanging up my calls? He tried to keep his tone calm. I thought it was a sales call. Sorry. She hadn't saved his number. This made Hudson even angrier. As he was about to unleash his frustration, his stomach protested in advance. Seizing the opportunity, Ariel suggested, Do you want to grab something to eat across the street? He shook his head, looking disgusted, too dirty. Ariel patiently explained, It's not dirty, and the food is delicious. I'm not going. Hudson was sulking, but his steps still followed her obediently. They crossed the road and arrived at a local food stall. Ariel found a round table away from the crowd. The owner brought two steaming bowls of egg fried rice. Hudson had no appetite and hesitated to pick up his chopsticks. He crossed his arms, glaring at Ariel, suddenly commanding, help me unwrap it. Really high maintenance. Ariel rolled her eyes in secret but did it anyway. She reached out, and as her fingertips touched the plastic wrapping, Hudson covered her hand. She turned her head, surprised, what are you doing? What do you think? Hudson pulled her closer, locking his gaze onto her, Ariel, you're so clever, handling Colin effortlessly. As for what I want, I don't believe you don't understand. 
Almost a naked confession. Hudson felt like he was on the chopping block, letting her dictate his fate. Ariel stared at him silently, her eyelashes fluttering, her eyes bright and shiny, tempting him to kiss her again. The two engaged in a silent struggle. At that moment, her phone on the table lit up twice, receiving messages from Wyatt. As she reached for it, Hudson held her other hand. His tone brooked no interference, don't go back. Break up with him right away. Ariel turned her face away, murmuring, already broke up. He's still looking for you after the breakup. Hudson didn't know whether to be happy or angry. He made Ariel unlock her phone, swiftly deleting Wyatt's contact information. Ariel looked at her contacts and grumbled, Are you crazy? I am damn crazy. Hudson raised his voice suddenly. In this completely unfamiliar environment, he no longer restrained himself, wrapping his arms tightly around her. Their cheeks almost touched, and he couldn't resist wanting to kiss her again. The two engaged in a silent struggle. At that moment, her phone on the table lit up twice, receiving messages from Wyatt. As she reached for it, Hudson held her other hand. His tone brooked no interference, don't go back. Break up with him right away. Ariel turned her face away, murmuring, already broke up. He's still looking for you after the breakup. Hudson didn't know whether to be happy or angry. He made Ariel unlock her phone, swiftly deleting Wyatt's contact information. Ariel looked at her contacts and grumbled, are you crazy? I am damn crazy. Hudson raised his voice suddenly. In this completely unfamiliar environment, he no longer restrained himself, wrapping his arms tightly around her. Their cheeks almost touched, and he couldn't resist wanting to kiss her again. It seemed that only in this way could he temporarily control her. Her emotions, her will, seemed to belong to him for a brief moment. Eleanor had just walked in when she noticed Hudson lost in thought. His face looked worn, a hint of stubble adorned his lips, and his clothes were creased, devoid of their usual elegance. Finding it odd, Eleanor changed into indoor shoes, approached him, and remarked, Did your business trip get so urgent that you didn't even change your clothes? Doesn't seem like you. Hudson blinked at her, instantly snapping out of his reverie. Calmly, he lied, had to meet a client unexpectedly, went straight from the office, didn't bring luggage. After saying this, he stood up and brushed his chin against her face. Eleanor laughed and pushed him away, saying, Go wash up quickly. Hudson went into the bathroom, turning on the shower. Despite the water flowing down, his thoughts remained in disarray. The actions he took in the past three days were even more outrageous than the initial kiss. He had, in a forceful manner, pleaded with Ariel to stay by his side. He was begging for love from her. It felt absurd to him, but it had indeed happened. The initial repulsion and disgust were, in fact, rooted in a strong attraction. Hudson found it challenging to face his genuine preferences. At the age of six or seven, he desperately wanted a pet, but his parents vehemently opposed it. So, he had the maid help him secretly keep a puppy in the basement. When his father discovered it, he cruelly killed the dog in front of him, smiling and saying, Hudson, see, this is the price of disobedience. Shocked, he covered his mouth, afraid to cry out loud. When the maid was interrogated by his father, he pretended to be deaf and mute, leading to her being insulted and fired. To avoid self-blame, he started to become numb and indifferent. Perhaps, at that time, his selfish, hypocritical, and weak nature was etched into his bones. Outside the bathroom, Eleanor reminded him, Hudson, are you okay? You've been in there for a while. Don't forget we have dinner with my parents tonight. Of course, I haven't forgotten, he replied. I'll be out soon. And so, Hudson was pulled back into the merciless reality. He had to be fully armed, ensuring no one could see any flaws. As the wedding date with Eleanor approached, he found himself entangled in numerous social obligations. Yet, after the busyness, he was left with a complete emptiness. Thinking about wearing the mask of a happy marriage throughout his life, he felt a sense of being swallowed up by fear. Not long after, he accompanied Eleanor to try on wedding dresses. She was beautiful, with a graceful figure, and she looked stunning in various gowns. Hudson smiled as he watched her, took photos, and heard the shop assistant say, You and your wife seem very affectionate. However, inside, he felt no ripples of emotion, and there was even a hint of unease. Who could find joy in the institution of marriage? Perhaps only wedding vendors. The next evening, Hudson went to the mall and bought many green dresses. He knocked on Ariel's door, making a rhythmic sound. Keep it down, she said as she opened the door slightly, glaring at him. Serves you right for ignoring me, he squeezed in, shoved the shopping bags into her arms, and unceremoniously sprawled on the couch. I bought these for you. 
You'll wear them for me later. Only allowed at home. Ariel, disgusted by his condescending demeanor, grabbed a cushion, attempting to hit him on the head. Instead, he caught her wrist and pulled her onto his lap. He held her, suppressing his anger. Why do you always oppose me, he asked. She smirked, you've never respected me. But I love you, Ariel, Hudson argued, pecking her face repeatedly. You're mine and can only belong to me. He actually said he loved her? To Ariel, it felt absurd. He loved her, so he looked down on her. He loved her, so his mood was unpredictable. He loved her, so he was domineering. He loved her, so he wanted her to be a puppet. His love was more malicious than hatred. As the wedding approached, Hudson's actions became more unrestrained. He often came home late or didn't return all night, offering weak excuses. Disappearing for a while, followed by a sweet period, as if that would be enough to appease. To be honest, all these were remnants of Eleanor's tactics. His reactions were interesting, impossible to conceal. Eleanor had long concluded that Hudson was hiding something from her, most likely involving another woman. She wasn't in a rush, rather a bit curious. She wanted to know what kind of woman could stir Hudson's emotions. Then, she found a photo of that girl in his wallet, round eyes, high nose bridge, two braided twists, faint freckles on the cheekbones, exuding youthful vigor and extraordinary vitality. Oh, it was her? Eleanor chuckled softly. She remembered Ariel. That young girl had a strong character, confident and decisive, not at all shy. A girl like her would be difficult to tame unless she willingly conformed. Eleanor unexpectedly felt a bit challenged by Hudson. She thought she was quite considerate of him. But recently, what bothered her a bit was Ariel's ex-boyfriend, Wyatt. Wyatt was too inexperienced, even though he had stepped into the entertainment industry, his thinking was still limited. He didn't understand the essence of playing along, retreating immediately when the time was right, onto the next scene. A few days ago, she and Hudson went to look at wedding dresses. Wyatt rashly insisted on meeting. Eleanor admitted she rarely got angry, but that time was an exception. Hurriedly trying on wedding dresses, she left Hudson behind, claiming to run into an old friend. Of course, this old friend was unwelcome. He took off his hat and sunglasses, revealing a pair of eyes that seemed to have cried. There was a charming pitifulness, if his audience could see it. Eleanor, enduring, asked, Wyatt, do you have urgent matters? Wyatt looked at her and asked softly, are you really getting married? Eleanor didn't see any problem with that. Calmly, she replied, it's my private matter. My matter. Then, what am I? Wyatt looked puzzled. You said you don't love Hudson at all. You love me. I've been thinking, working hard to make money, to be worthy of you, to marry you. Love doesn't really mean anything, Eleanor interrupted him in time, like a patient teacher at the end of her patience. Marriage isn't about love. I love you now, and I'll love someone else in the future. Love is ever-changing, dynamically flowing. She gently placed her hand on Wyatt's shoulder, trying to console him. I love you, and the subject of that sentence isn't love, it should be you and me. When we were together, we were truly happy and content. That's enough. The meaning of life lies in the process. Half of Wyatt's body stiffened. The beautiful woman in front of him had once taught him what true love was, a union of body and mind. But now, she said love wasn't important. All her longing and confessions were fake. Ironically, he still held them as a standard. Eleanor turned around with a face full of weariness and walked away. Wyatt knew she only considered him a pastime, and once the novelty wore off, she would be tossed into the trash heap. She wouldn't call him again, wouldn't whisper sweet words into his ears, wouldn't use her soft hands to guide him. They ended like this. Wyatt felt lost in the wilderness. Following his memories, he instinctively returned to Ariel's former residence. They had known each other since they were teenagers, supporting each other through thick and thin. But because of Eleanor's joke, he and Ariel went their separate ways. The simple warmth that was once easily obtainable, he negligently overlooked. Now, wanting to reclaim it, everything had changed. Ariel had blocked all his contact information. Was it out of hatred? Did she not let go of him? Was it too late to regret now? A dense pain pierced through his chest. Wyatt prepared to go upstairs immediately to find her. But soon, his footsteps became hesitant. A young couple passed by him. The man tightly held the girl's shoulders, whispering intimately in her ear. Wyatt was too familiar with Ariel, even if it was just her back, he could confirm it was her. Especially with Hudson looking down on him, giving him a disdainful and mocking look, as if boasting in the posture of a victor. His heart almost stopped. The last string in Wyatt's mind suddenly snapped.
Ariel heard about Wyatt again when he injured his agent and was sent to jail. She sighed inwardly. Wyatt had always been gentle and pure-hearted, even acting courageously in the past, otherwise, they wouldn't have met Eleanor and Hudson. Now, he ended up in jail for harming someone, a strange twist of fate. Ariel visited him once. In just two months, his hair was cut even shorter than before, almost against his scalp. His eyes were lowered, and his face lost its luster. How are you holding up? Ariel asked him. Wyatt casually replied, fine. Even with a heart full of grievances, he couldn't confide in her anymore. After all, he had betrayed her. Exploited for the last bit of value, frozen out by the company, insulted by the higher-ups. After impulsively throwing a punch, he suddenly realized the whole situation, since Eleanor had the power to shape a muse, she could easily cast him down from the pedestal. In essence, he shouldn't have provoked her in the first place. Ariel was oblivious to all this. She said, your dad called me before, asking about your situation. I sent him 5,000 yuan for a good new year. I said, after the new year, everything will be fine. You can start anew next year. Why do you still care about what I do? Wyatt's eyes welled up. Ariel remained silent for a long time, just staring at him. After a while, she spoke, Wyatt, do you remember the summer last year? One night, the circuit malfunctioned, the air conditioner broke down, and it was sweltering inside. Wyatt nodded. Ariel's lips curved into a slight smile. But I only realized it the next day. You were so silly, fanning me all night until your hands went numb and cramped. I teased you, asking why you didn't go to a hotel for a night, wondering if it was because you were too stingy. Do you remember how you answered? Wyatt dared not speak, quietly gazing at her. You shook your head, saying it was because my sleep quality wasn't good. It was hard for me to fall back asleep once I woke up, so you didn't want to disturb me, asking me to have a good sleep. At that moment, I thought, this must be what love is. Even my mom might not be able to do that. Also, I'll tell you a secret. I got into this place not by accident but entirely because of you. I liked you since I was a child. She chuckled, took a deep breath, and continued, so, in a way, we were blessed by fate. We actually loved each other. Looking back, I still feel very fortunate. Even if you say you don't love me anymore, knowing you is still a good part of my life. Ariel. Wyatt lifted his head, tears streaming down slowly. He wanted to reach out and touch her face, but she stood up and said, Wyatt, I have to go. The weather is cold, don't forget to wear the clothes I brought for you. Don't catch a cold. Her last words were, goodbye. Perhaps, goodbye forever. In this year, Ariel left two men successively, but she didn't feel particularly sad. In other words, she had simply experienced, explored, dated, and realized the essence of men. Regardless of their status, their arrogance, hypocrisy, selfishness, and foolishness remained consistent. Thinking of this, a smile appeared on her lips. Hudson, on the other hand, cried like a fool, looking extremely disheveled. On his 30th birthday, he went to a French restaurant with Ariel. In the same restaurant where they failed to go before, they unexpectedly ran into Eleanor, like a boomerang of fate, circling and finally hitting themselves. Eleanor remained remarkably composed, leaving Hudson at a loss. Frustrated, he tore off his mask, declaring that he would call off the wedding because he had found the person he truly loved and intended to be with her forever. Eleanor stayed calm throughout. She said, sure, that's completely fine with me. Marriage is not a necessity for me. But, Hudson, have you ever thought that, in your moment of impulsiveness, your father, my parents, both families who had been preparing for this wedding for so many years, all of it would go down the drain just like that? They will never let you off the hook. Hudson felt a sharp pain, realizing the gravity of the situation. He pinned his last hope on Ariel, begging her, as long as you're willing, I can give up everything. We can leave here and start anew somewhere else. But she had no interest. Ariel was even more direct, saying, Hudson, you are disgustingly weak. Not only did you use me as a tool against authority, but you also tried to make me bear all the responsibility. Meanwhile, you just needed to wave the flag of love high. Unfortunately, neither of us buys into this. Eleanor summarized, not every woman craves love like a lovesick fool. Did you two plan this together? Hudson suddenly felt completely isolated. These two women in front of him seemed to have him under complete control. One believed he wouldn't dare to resist, while the other skillfully extricated herself from his entanglements. He realized a cruel truth, no one had ever truly cared about him. What they needed was a dazzling puppet named Hudson. So, he began to cry loudly, drowning his sorrows in alcohol, 
crying until he squatted on the roadside, retching. Eleanor called a designated driver for him. Out of courtesy, the driver asked about his situation. Eleanor whispered, sorry, my husband just went through a breakup. Please don't disturb him. The driver looked bewildered, then fell silent. Hudson sat in the back seat, leaning his head on Eleanor's shoulder, muttering the name of another person. She stroked his stiff hair, repeating, I'm here, I'm here. Fool, I'm probably the best you'll ever have. Tears fell inexplicably. Eleanor thought, perhaps she pitied him for a moment, and that should be forgivable. The wedding proceeded as scheduled. Along the flower-lined path leading to the main stage, excitement filled the air. The bride and groom, adorned in meticulously tailored wedding attire, were surrounded by a whirlwind of cameras, capturing the palpable heartbeat between them. During the waiting moments, Hudson suddenly brought up Wyatt, I visited him, and I only found out something yesterday. You actually had a history with him. Eleanor, with an expressionless face, retorted, Are you questioning my taste? Of course not, Hudson chuckled, as if detached from the situation. So, it seems there's some truth to it. Don't mind me, I'm just shocked. It appears that this cunning couple interfered in our relationship just before our wedding, playing their roles discreetly, leading us both to betrayal. Why do you say that? You see, before our wedding, they unexpectedly intervened in our relationship, playing their roles opportunistically, causing us both to face betrayal. Hudson spoke confidently. Eleanor blinked, remaining silent. Hudson paused, then sighed, fortunately, my fiancé and I have a strong bond, stronger than gold, allowing us to withstand various temptations and arrive at the sacred temple of marriage. He looked at her, his expression sly and intriguing. Eleanor couldn't help but tease, what's this? Isn't Ariel your true love? Hudson chuckled bitterly, come on, don't mention her in front of me. Just thinking about her gives me a headache. Actually, it's quite regrettable. I've dated many girls, and they're all married now, but I still don't know what true love is. Eleanor gently linked her arm with his. In my opinion, so-called true love is like an immersive role play. The deeper you get into the role, the more real the love becomes. Well then, it's our turn to take the stage, Hudson. Are you ready to play the roles of the newlyweds? I find that you always talk to me like you're training a dog, Hudson laughed, a somewhat eerie laughter. Because men are always more childish, fragile, and arrogant than women, she scoffed. The main stage was brightly lit, with romantic music filling the air. Pink petals fluttered through the sky, and the aroma of cake and wine wafted through the venue. The world warped and distorted with joy as diverse faces reveled in the celebration. Hand in hand, they stood under the spotlight, exchanging vows, kisses, and rings, gazing at each other with tears of warmth. Just by looking at their backs, they seemed like a deeply in love couple. However, when the camera shifted, the two stared at each other stiffly, their dark pupils reflecting a striking emptiness and confusion. The lifetime had yet to begin, yet it seemed to have already come to an end.